So yeah, I'll like mention going on a money date, like total novel idea to me. Do you go on money dates? Like, do you talk about money on a date with your husband? No, we, we talk about our kids. Oh, <laughs> that's a big no-no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Fletcher. And I'm Rivki Silver. And this is Deep Meaningful Conversations, powered by Meaningful Minute, the podcast where we explore the complexities, nuances, and joys of being a firm woman. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us again today for another episode of Deep Meaningful Conversations. We are so happy to have you all back. Yep. And today we're talking about orthonomics. Ever heard of it? Because you're not going to find it in the dictionary. <laughs> it's like orthodox and economics mixed together. Yep. Right, Alex? Mm-hmm. Mm. And it seems that the From community really has its own unique socionomic setup, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we typically have large families, large expenses that come with that, large tuition bills, um, large homes to fit our large families. We often live in large and expensive communities so the question with orthonomics is like how does it all work like how does it all add up (laughs) right exactly and when you try to do the math to figure it out it like or when you look at your neighbor and try to figure it out (laughs) it doesn't make much sense right right? um i remember so distinctly when i was in seminary my friend maya and i were sitting like in harnof and we were saying like how how do all these couples do it like Mm -hmm. we were like poor seminary students and like we were like we don't understand how this all works Mm -hmm. um it seems to be like a futile effort to try to figure it out for many reasons. So does that mean we give up on budgeting? Like what we definitely should give up on is trying to figure out other people's budgets. Yes. <laughs> that's a great point. And I think that's like the best takeaway of this episode. Like stop trying to figure it out for other people. You have to figure it out for yourself and it's none of your business and you're never going to figure it out. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So um, actually, this topic has been on my mind for a while, for years. It's something that I find just really interesting and fascinating and mystifying. Mm -hmm. And I finally sat down to write an article about it um, in Mishpacha last winter. I called it Fuzzy Math. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it's sort of fuzzy. (laughs) And um, Baruch Hashem has spurred a lot of conversation on the pages of Mishpacha. I was so grateful for. And to me, it just, it really proved to me that there, you know, so many of us in our communities also have questions about the economics of living a from life. Absolutely. I I remember that article very well, Alex. And I actually remember, I don't know if you remember, when we were at the JCC Park years and years and years ago, we were talking about this exact topic. I do. Yeah, a long time ago. And that article that you wrote, Fuzzy Math, how many uh, conversation continues did it spur? Like, at least two. Yeah, there were a lot. a lot of um, letters, you know, it sort of had a nerve. Um, yeah, and time. I think in a good way, you know. A hundred percent. And people wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I actually, if you don't mind, Rafi, just want to read a little excerpt from it. Yeah, go right ahead. Um, really, I think, just paints a picture of the issue we're discussing on the episode today. So the mystery surrounding orthonomics is one that many people wonder about but do not candidly discuss due to the private nature of personal finances and the very real role of Siata Tashmaya when it comes to our bank accounts. However, it is obvious to anyone living in our communities that the more the issue is shrouded in mystery, with Hashem helps, provided as a pat solution to paying the well over $100,000 needed to marry off a few children, let alone to send them to study for Israel for a year, (laughs) <laughs> the more disheartened people become as they look around the community with its ever-rising standards and wonder what crash course and from, from survival they missed. <laughs> people are not only mystified, they're also frustrated. They have no idea how they're meant to swing it without trust funds or parental support because those are the common reasons for why people who are not in lucrative careers still seem to be managing fine. People are struggling to make it to the end of the month and feel constantly pressured by rising communal standards everywhere they turn, even as they're trying to turn their heads away. Everything in the community, from the cars others are driving to the houses they're knocking down, the Kedushim... Did I say that right? I think so. What, Kedushim? Kedushim? Yeah. Kiddushes? Kiddushes. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I wrote it, but I don't know how to pronounce it. The Kiddushes their friends are making and the clothes they buy reminds them of what they must be doing wrong when it comes to from finances. So I think, I mean, the purpose of this piece for me was just sort of to validate the frustration and just like say it out loud, like say the elephant in the room. I I really had no solutions. (laughs) At the end, I'm like, hmm, this is a problem. So guys, what do you think? (laughs) No, but it was beautiful. And you really... You really named it so well, and you gave voice to it in such a very clear way, yeah. a very relatable way, Thank clearly you. by all of the response that you yeah. got. So Thank you. That you was know, the goal. And 
you know, this topic and the response and just everything that you said, this is why we're continuing the conversation here in Deep Meaningful Conversations, yeah, right? so excited. On the DMC podcast. It's a deep, complex issue and it has no pat answers. Yeah. It's very individualized and there are so many multiple factors at play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, I definitely want to give give that message here on our podcast is we're not here just to give simple answers. I mean, we're so excited to have Yael um, Trush, who we're bringing in. Um, who I think actually does have, I don't want to call them answers, but serious mindset shifts. Yeah. Like serious inspiration. Great hadracha. Great hadracha. Yeah, exactly. And um, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, to have this conversation, we wanted to bring in someone who is experienced and passionate about the topic of from finances. Yeah. And the perfect person for this conversation is Yael Trush. Yael is an MBA money coach and host of the award-winning podcast, Jewish Money Matters. Her signature programs, God Wants You to Be Rich and Jewish Money Makeover, have transformed the financial lives of countless Jewish women and couples all over the globe. Her Jewish financial insights have been featured in Real Simple Magazine, Chabad.org, H.com, and numerous podcasts, and now ours. Yeah. Um, she's a native of San Juan, Puerto Rico. Yael currently resides in Houston, Texas with her husband and four children. Yep. So here is our DMC with Yael Trash. And we really hope you gain as much from it as Rifki and I did. Absolutely. Yael, welcome to Deep Meaningful Conversations. We are so excited to have you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this, really. Yeah, great. Um, just so you know, we have a link to your website, jewishlatinprincess.com, as well as to your podcast, which we're going to be talking about. So everyone, please check that out in the show notes. Um, so I first just want to hear from you, like, how do you get to be a money coach, like helping mm-hmm. from women in the community? Yeah, that's that's a great it's a great story, I think. And it's funny that you mentioned my website because it's long like we're actually building a new website. Yeah, I'll trust that come. But yeah, that works for the time being. And yes, you're right. Um, now the podcast is Jewish Money Matters as opposed to Jewish Latin Princes. What happened um, was that many years ago, I started a blog. First of all, I started as an educator for Jewish women and I was teaching all these classes, um, particularly in Spanish. And I was seeing that there was always an overarching theme in everything that I was saying, whether we were learning about a holiday or we were learning about Parsha or whatever it was, there was this theme of, listen, Judaism is something that is part and parcel of our life. It's not something that you pull out of the closet once a year. It's it should inform everything that we do. And I said, how could we how could we get this message out there? And it was the days of blogging. We're talking many, many years ago. And I was like, what if I had a blog? So I started a blog where I would talk about all the things that women are interested in, parenting and art and beauty and uh, decorating your homes, our business and money. And I would weave spiritual insights into it. And it was so much fun. What happened was then I got into podcasts. I was an avid podcast listener. This is way before podcasts were really, really popular. In the meantime, I also became a speaker and I would travel around and I give all these classes and I started feeling like, what is it that I'm really helping people with? Because people don't go around saying I have a spiritual need. We're Mm -hmm. physical beings. We have physical pain points. So I could notice that women had four pain points. One would be a pain point around their parenting second around their marriage or their intimate life, their relationship with food or body and their relationship with money. And I was like, Mm. well, I'm a good mother, but I don't really want to talk about parenting the whole time. I could say a lot about marriage, but I don't know if I want to do that in day in and day out. I have nothing to say about food and body image. I actually have a lot to say about money. Amazing. Not only because I studied this stuff and I had a career in this, I have an MBA, I studied economics, I worked in finance, but I had a really profound personal experience with changing my relationship with money and my money habits. And would you know that Judaism was integral to that transformation? And how come I don't communicate that, right? And so I started playing with that idea. In the meantime, the podcast was happening. It was not about money at all. I was still like, kind of like staying in my safe zone either, even though I really interviewed a lot of people who had a lot to say about money until I was challenged to give a really interesting TED talk, TED talk type speech for a Jewish organization. And I was going to pull out some old notes from anything that I've talked about before. And my husband challenged me. He said, you need to do it about money. I was like, oh my gosh. And it was like the (laughs) hardest speech that I've ever written. Now it's like no problem, right? When I gave that talk, it was literally like I hit a raw nerve. You could hear a pin drop, the amount of questions that came after the feedback, the emotion, like people wanted more. And I was like, 
oh God, I get it. You really want me to be doing this, but it's so scary, but I really have to do it. And then, you know, I kept evolving from there and I started writing more about, you know, in Chabad.org and in Asia and this and that until I launched my own online course. And until naturally the podcast needed to become an extension of my work, if I really wanted to be helping women and couples with this relationship, the relationship that they have with money. So that's how we ended up here. Beautiful. Yeah. I just love these stories of identifying a need, starting small, and then just seeing how it's exploded. It's so inspiring. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is like, where does God need me to serve? Right. And, and when you notice that fear, it's like, you know, that, that you need to be <laughs> on the other. So that's exactly where you need to be. Um, so yeah, and thank God it's been a beautiful journey and, uh, it's allowed me to help a lot of women, a lot of couples, and we get a lot of positive feedback and it's amazing. 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 Well, you are the expert in the space and we cannot wait to pick your brain. So let's go. <laughs> We're going to start with question number one here of our set about orthonomics. That's our, that's mm. our title today. I don't know who, you know what? Orthonomics. I saw it on a blog. There was a blog a number of years ago called orthonomics. I and mean, I, I, I remember that. Yeah. Blog. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh. So, but it's, I it's thought that. you came up with a term. I learned yeah. it from you years ago. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? It is you emailed also a me a question. Project. It's yes, so it's funny because you email. emailed me a question years ago on the yes. topic. And I was like, oh, what an interesting <laughs> term. <laughs> I remember that. I sort of oh. stole it. Again, I don't even know who to cite it. Anyway. Um, so yeah, so there's this term that we call orthodontics. And it, you know, people might be like, well, what does that even mean? So it generally refers to this unique financial system of the orthodox lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from you, you know, what does that term mean to you? Wow. What an interesting question. Well, I just told you, I only, I only learned it from you. So now yeah. I know kind of what it means. And you just said it beautifully. You know, I think for me, it, it really means an amazing privilege of like this relationship that I have with God that I get to do these things. And I don't know that that is necessarily typical what people think, because I've heard a lot of the threads and the conversation that happens again around this topic. And I'm always so um, amazed at how we could see different things in two different lights. So for me, the, the idea that, yeah, there is a price tag on Jewish life is actually a beautiful idea. It's like, this is a valuable product. Mm. This is not Walmart. This is Saks, <laughs> right? And, and I get to be part of that. I get like, God has chosen me and my family to be part of this. That's not to deny that it could be challenging. And then, and again, it's like, and I've been, and I totally get it. I, I want to make sure that we are all clear that I have actually been on the receiving end of chesed from the community to pay for things like yom tov and like tuition. And then I've been on the giving end. Like I've had a lot of money and I've very little money. And I always go back to the idea of why is God presenting this challenge to me? Like, what does it really mean for me and my family? So I think a lot of when a lot of what happens is sometimes when we talk about, we have the orthonomics conversation, which is an important conversation to be had. We tend to focus on systemic issues and the other, the other, and what that system is doing to me. And what I like to challenge people with, and what I do for myself and with my students is, well, what do you need to do about that? Because see, the challenge is not the system. The challenge comes from God. Anything that has been presented to you is from God Almighty. So what does God need me to do? What is the inner work? It's so much easier to focus on the outer work, right? How can I fix that problem and that school tuition and that principal who's charging that much? But really, 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 it's what do I need to fix inside? What is my mindset? Where is my level of trust? What is, where is my, where are my handcuffs with money? Why am I, why can't, what does God need from me so that I could be a part of that solution? But it starts with me. Mm -hmm. So I, I flip it on its head and I know it's hard. I'm, I'm suggesting that we all do harder work, <laughs> but I'm also suggesting that it's beautiful work. I'm also suggesting that when we focus on what God needs from us and what is this challenge here to teach us, the solution and the outcome is so much greater. Hmm. Beautiful. This is why we're having you all on deep, meaningful conversations. Absolutely. And I love that. I love the idea of like really, truly what can we control? The only thing we can control are our own responses to whatever is going yeah. on in our life. That is yes. really 
ultimately it. Um, at the same time, there are certain challenges that do seem to crop up, like, you know, generally speaking in the firm world. And I was just wondering what, what do you see are the financial challenges that are unique to firm families? And maybe what are some common pitfalls that you see people falling into if they are, you know, getting in the mindset of, of being frustrated by the challenge and before they get to the point where they can use it as an opportunity to grow, what are some common pitfalls that you see? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about the challenge, I think we can, we can all recognize again, the price tag, right? For, for many people, it is, it, it definitely is a price tag. And so there are challenges of how do I spend, right? It's cut. Do I need to cut my expenses? And there are challenges of how much do I actually make and where do I need to grow in order to make more that, you know, that's a real reality. And sometimes God is pushing us in that direction. And that's, that's, that requires a lot of inner work and a lot of courage, right? Um, and so I think a lot of the pitfall, even before, like you said, Rifki, very well said, even before we get to that place of turning the challenge around, is we don't take the time to be intentional about how do I actually relate to money and how am I actually managing it? And so we mm-hmm. kind of go through the motions on autopilot and we just assume that this is what needs to be done without actually taking time if we are married with our spouse to sit down and reflect not just on the way we're managing our money, but even before that, what is this relationship? What is the story that I'm carrying around? What is the story that you're carrying around? And what's the story that we want to build together? And now how do, how do our financial choices, how are they reflecting the story that we actually want to communicate. What are the values in our family? And are we financing those values? So I think that we forget that any relationship requires an investment in time. And it's not something that we we need to be intentional with. Like if we recognize that money is a resource that God has given us to create tremendous amount of impact and beauty in the world, then it needs nurturing. And that nurturing requires that I set some time in my calendar to actually sit with this, even though it's going to be uncomfortable. I'm not going to suggest that it's not uncomfortable because most of us have never been taught how to how to talk about money and it's how to right, even manage right, it. Right. Right. We've been taught that we've been, I mean, I, for sure, personally, we've taught to specifically not talk about money because it is not polite or whatever socialization comes around the money. Like you don't talk about money. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so we come into this relationship and guess what? I don't know about you guys, but money is a big part of building an adult life. Married right. or like you, at some point you are going to talk about it, whether it be your husband, whether it be with your roommate, whether it be with your boss, Money is part and parcel of life. And so a Jew should never be rejecting money. On the contrary, (laughs) on the contrary, Mm -hmm. we need to be engaged with it. It's such an incredible tool. And so what I'm suggesting is that one of the pitfalls is not engaging in that relationship Mm -hmm. and trying to distance ourselves from that relationship. And yet we expect that it should flow and it should be wonderful. It should be beautiful. And I'm like, well, if we want that, how about we treat it? How about we give it some time? How about we t- give it some attention? We tend to give it a lot of negative attention. And what we need to do is start giving it the proper kind of attention. Mm. Wow. Like you said in the beginning, Al, it's stressful. So often mm-hmm. it's an avoidance technique. Where yeah, it's we negative don't wanna... attention, right? Right. We, we're not paying the avoid right... talking about it. Exactly. You know, and... but, in the, but it's still here. Like, it's like, mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about it, but it, like, I'm so worried. I'm so stressed. And like the mm-hmm. minute my husband brings it up or my parents-in-law or my in-law, like, there's a, like a blow up, right? It's so much negative attention. And what we're mm-hmm. saying is how about we schedule some time regularly in our calendars to give it the proper attention that it needs Beautiful. Beautiful. instead of always atta- like being on emergency mode. Yeah. Oh, it definitely feels like that. Yeah. And you know, and in a marriage, <laughs> I like your, I like how you're presenting this in context of the re- the marriage relationship is that each spouse is coming in with their own baggage yeah. and with their own, you know, possible trauma, who knows? Yes. Associated with money. Absolutely. And then it's like, oh, and now we just need to discuss this like calmly. Hey, are we saving for weddings? <laughs> you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Or what's our monthly budget? I mean, yeah. it's like, it's like a minefield. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why, by the way, we, I always tell my students, you never start your money dates with the numbers. Money yeah. dates, the process of money dates needs to always start with the values conversation and the dream. What's a money date? 
Uh oh! Oh, don't great question. Mo- a money date or a money party or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> oh, I love a money party. I yeah, love, I'm throwing up dollars. <laughs> what yes. is that? Oh, let's do that. Yes, let's call it a money fiesta. Um, <laughs> <My fiesta. laughs> really, what it is? It's regularly scheduled times on your calendars where you discuss your financial decisions oh, and how no, they align exactly. with your values. Yeah. Well, I'm feeling guilt. I'm feeling stress and guilt hearing this because we don't do that. <laughs> okay, so I, I could teach you how, and then okay, you're gonna okay. you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, this is the best best thing that happened to my marriage. Uh, I wait, I'm gonna wait for that call in in 30 days. Okay. 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 I okay. think we'll, we'll have to bring you on again because there's just so much to talk about here. <laughs> okay, ladies. If by you the want way, to know about the money dates. By yeah. the way, there I have a free guide for anybody who wants uh, it. It's on JewishLatinPrincess.com forward slash money date. So Amazing. everything you want to know about the money date, how to structure them, what is it that you do? It's right there. Okay. Amazing. Show notes? Yeah. We'll, we'll put, put it, we'll yes. link to it in the show notes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that is great. I'm going to go take a look at that. Okay. <laughs> what I love about you and your approach is you have this like Torah Hashkafic approach that really is the foundation of, of how you view money. And I just love to hear if you can, you know, sum up your Hashkafic approach to money. Yeah. Oh, I love that question. Yes. So my approach to money is like I mentioned before, that it is a tool that the creator of the world has given us in order so that we can complete the mission that he gave us in this world, which is to bring the redemption. Therefore, just like I have a relationship with my body, I have a relationship with everything that is physical around me. I also have a relationship with money. It's not an type of like a necessary evil relationship, just like the Mm. relationship I have with my body is not a necessary evil because the soul needs the body in order to fulfill the messianic uh, vision. And so too, God has given the Jewish people money so that we can realize that mission. And so when I have that mindset, then again, it's like, what a responsibility and how humbling it is that God allows me to utilize this. And then we take it to the first question. I get to utilize it for mitzvahs. Whoa, that is mind blowing. Like if we really get to it, it is mind blowing. It's such a blessing. Mm. It's an incredibly pr- like powerful reframing of mm. the entire thing. Instead of being like, oh my gosh, you know, why, why is, you know, Tania's clothing so expensive? Be like, oh, look at this. I get to spend money on making sure that my body is clothed in a beautiful Tania way. Like to, yes. instead of being like, ur, 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 to be like, this is incredible. I love the, I love the, it's not Walmart, it's Saks. I'm going to keep thinking about <laughs> that. <It's> like <laughs> But that doesn't after. mean, I'm, I have a nagging question though. It doesn't mean though, oh, that means that we can spend a lot of money because that's what it yeah. takes to be a from Jew though. Like no, that's so- not an excuse to swipe that credit card. Apps. <laughs> well, well, we'll see, see what happens is, and here's the challenge for all of us, whether we're from or not, this is the, this is the challenge of, of wealth. The challenge of wealth, the challenge of money is whether we unite it with its creator, with its source, right. And it's aligned, it's aligned with the mission that we're here to fulfill or whether we divorce it from the source. And so what tends to happen from or not from what tends to happen is we are self oriented individuals. And so the money can become a source of arrogance and pride. It's so easy to disconnect from the real source and to attribute the the results, to attribute the wealth or whatever, the blessing to our own doing, right? And it, like, even if we look now at these partials that we're looking at, right, the gold that was given to us for the Mishkan, it's so interesting, right? The gold had a specific, the wealth that we took out of Mitzrayim had a purpose. It was to build the house of God in this world, in the physical world. That's what we're doing. And we're doing it today, right? That's what you and I do every single day. And what did we do with that gold? We had to mush it. It had to become thin, right? The ego had to be taken out of it. It's not about me. It's about serving the creator of the world. It's about bringing him into the world, revealing him. It's about what do I need to do to advance the mission, right? And then we have to cut it into thin strips. So the wealth or the gold or the gelt or the money, there's no problem with it in and of itself. We should never push it away. On the contrary, we should welcome it. But we have to constantly work on the mindset. Am I aligning myself with the mission? Am I spending so that my neighbors could know that I have such a bar mitzvah or such a house? Or is this really what advances the values and the mission of this family? And that's why I said those conversations need to start with what are the real values of this family and how do we finance them? 
Mm. Beautiful. So it's like starting with reframing it and like taking away the negative and putting the positive and then continuing to doing the check in and to be, to yeah. increase that self-awareness about like what, what is the real in the core behind like our habits. Mm-hmm. So my jam, I love this. Me too. Um, so budgeting, like spending, saving, splurging, we're, we're getting into this a little bit. What are your thoughts and what advices and approach do you give about, you know, how, how we do use the money that Hakadosh mm-hmm. Baruch Hu has given us? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I think, I think the management piece is so important. And when we've been working on our mindset, and that doesn't mean that you have to sit and work on your mindset and then start managing. No, it's, it's a two part process, and we need to be engaged with it. Mm. Uh, and that means that as we are trying to work on this mindset, and we're learning about trust, and we're doing all this mindset work, we also have to engage with the money, we have to look at our cash flow, we have to actually, even if it's uncomfortable, we have to say, if I'm an agent of God in this world, then it means that I have a responsibility to manage it properly. So I have to sit and I have to say, oh, this is how much we make. Are we taking Meister out of it every single month? Or are we not fulfilling that obligation? Whoa, well, that should not be if I'm not, right? And I say charity is one of my primary values as a family, and that's not happening in the exact way that God has prescribed. Well, something has to change, right? And what are my other values? Am I financing them? Well, no, but I'm putting money in this other thing. Hmm, maybe I want to shift that. So it does require engaging with your money, with your cash flow, understanding how much money is coming in, where is it going out, and where do I want it to go out, right? Um, And I think... It's a process that doesn't happen overnight. But again, going back to those money dates, if we actually set the time to be intentional and all we have to do is, again, put ourselves in that place. Well, God wants me to have this. Right. So then I'm going to I'm going to step up to the plate and really do this because it's my responsibility as an agent of God in this world. Then I can actually calmly, you know, sit with my numbers and you don't have to build Rome in a day. Right. You take it step by step and you get that familiarity and you understand how do you spend? Do we want to spend on that? How do I how, how do I talk to my children when I'm now changing certain paradigms when I'm changing a certain dynamic in my family of how I'm going to be spending. Oh, those are important conversations mm-hmm. to be had if I get to that point. Right. So all of that now starts to happen. Mm. It's part of that budgeting piece where we look at that cash flow, And this really leads into the next question is we may say, you know what, I do want to buy that $200 dress for my daughter, or my daughter actually wants four of those 200 dresses Mm -hmm. and they're sneas and they're beautiful. And she needs to dress sneas and you should dress beautiful. By the end of the day, we can't go into debt for that. So we're going to have to find other sneas and beautiful clothes. Or we're going to have to wait. Right. We're going to have to wait, you know, like how, how would you handle that? Yeah, no. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. If, if I know that I don't want to go into debt and I understand that that's not the responsible way to, to deal with my money, then I have to make a trade-off at some point. And that's okay. I think, I think we are, we have a lot of fears. I speak a lot of about this. I recently have an article on this on Chabad.org about how to talk to our kids about money. We, we are more afraid about what our kids are going to think than we should be in terms relative to the lesson, the positive lesson that we can impart. See, our children are going to become adults one day and they're going to have to make trade-offs. That's just how it is. Like if your battery of your car dies when you're 25, you have a choice. You either pull from savings, right? Or you get into debt to fix your car. One or the other, they're going to have to make that right? So we're just modeling for them. Okay. So this is important. This is part of our values. Like you said, right now I'm choosing to invest in something else because guess what? We're saving for camp so I can buy one dress and I'm going to be looking at when these go on sale because I know they tend to go on sale and when they're $50, I'll probably get them. Right. And it's okay for our kids to feel disappointed because when we come into adulthood, there are going to be times when we're going to be disappointed, we're not always going to be able to buy that dress or those pair of shoes because I'm saving for my next trip to Israel. And in the context of my family values at this moment, that seems to be a priority, right? So we're always prioritizing. And the more we engage in that process with confidence, the better our kids are going to be at that process. I'm so glad you mentioned the parenting piece because oh, absolutely a huge factor. For, for sure. The open conversations, just like we're talking here about open conversations with your spouse, 
there should be open conversations. Yeah. See, part of the part of the pitfalls talking about pitfalls you asked me before, Rifki, is that we don't talk about money. Yeah. Like yeah. it's but but yeah. but that's not a Jewish approach. It's it's like it's part and parcel of life. It's beautiful. What's there not to talk about? Like my kids know that we have a miser account. Like my kids know that that's expected of the family. My kids know what we're saving for. People, they need to know. My husband needs. Everybody needs to know. But this is a family unit, and you know, just like we talk about how many red peppers we're going to buy and what, we also talk about the money with no shame because a Jew has no shame in money. There's no shame in the money. Again, it's the gold that God gave us to bring Mashiach. Like, what could what could be shameful about that? I need to give you this like megaphone. Well, <laughs> now we're on meaningful minutes, so I am so yeah. excited. So yeah. many people can hear this approach because it is so inspiring and like just like you said, like a mindset shift. Right, and I and I feel like also just like the the nakuda of like not being scared of our kids feeling disappointment. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. that that's a call in general and parenting in general. Like yeah. you know, because it's like because like you said when we are all adults and do we experience disappointment? Yeah. I bet we all do. Yeah. Yeah. They can handle it. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. It. And, it, yeah. and this is the training ground now in childhood. Yes. We have this opportunity now to, to shape their future attitudes towards money. Yeah. And, and can, I'm not and- suggesting that we perpetuate kind of a narrative or like, of like money doesn't grow in trees, by the way, it does. Mm-hmm. It's just paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like none of that, like it doesn't have to come with scarcity. Really. It really doesn't. Yeah. It's just, this is how we're choosing to spend our money right now, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and have those conversations and allow them to have their own money. I think that's a big one. So mm-hmm. many times our kids just are just used to using our credit card or our Apple Pay. Mm-hmm. Let them use their own money. Let them make their own decisions now when the stakes are low, right? And yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't wonderful, say anything wonderful. when they make a not such a good smart choice. Just ask a ton of questions. <laughs> Right. That's like ask the kids the questions like, well, what, like, why did what you make that decision? Thinking? Like, like right. what, kind of, yeah. what do you think? Oh, really? What are you thinking? How much do you want to keep in savings and how much do you want to invest? You know, my, my kids have investment accounts and they're always like, well, when do I get to touch that money? <laughs> you're an adult. And what do I use it for? You tell me, oh. maybe you want to buy yourself a house. Maybe you want to open a Chabad house. Maybe you want to open a community center. Maybe you want to go on a trip with you. I don't know. They have that, that much exciting? money in savings. <laughs> They, they will by the time well, they're it's adults. growing. It's growing. I don't know what you're going to do with it. Isn't that exciting? Right. And they're like, yeah. okay, okay. So keep $20 in the savings. And because I don't really need that much cash and just put everything in the investment. Okay. Whatever you say. <laughs> as long as my has been taken. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Perfect. That's perfect. Amazing. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap up our conversation with the, you know, the big topic that's addressed when we talk about orthonomics. And that is, you know, the pressure that many feel to mm. keep up with the Cohen's to yeah. keep up with the rising material standards in our community. Um, how, how would you help those of us who are feeling that pressure? Yeah, I would hope that after listening to us today, the, the pressure is kind of like mm-hmm. gone down because honestly, the pressure is comes when we are not approaching money as this unique gift that is unique to us. Like what is my own family and individual circumstance? And what am I here to do with that? Um, when we get go, go to a place of identifying what is my family's mission? What do we stand for? And what are my values? Right. Then a lot of the pressure disappears because it's about me and my family. Then I can just make a decision that, but again, we have to do this before every financial decision, this is not something that's going to happen a month before your the, your daughter's wedding or your son's bar mitzvah, yeah. or it's not. We have to be engaged in this conversation continuously. It has to be a continuous relationship and process where we are clear on where we're standing in the relationship. And then so every decision has more to do about with what has got one from me in this moment? What do I need to be financing right now? And has zero to do with what everybody else might be think. Mm-hmm. I mean, making decisions like that from a place of clarity, it is so empowering. And you will learn so much about yourself. Like maybe that kind of simcha is not you really your style. Mm-hmm. And but you never even questioned it because we didn't sit down mm-hmm. to actually think about it with time and intentionality. 
Hmm. Fascinating. And then I guess like when you bring your children into the conversation, like we're having the open conversation. Yes. So then also, because that's, that's, that's the first thing that's going to my mind. Well, it's, cute Ask maybe about I don't mind a lower standard of a, of a bar mitzvah or whatever, but like, what if my kid wants like an over, you know? So, but then when we're all on the same page as a family, so then, and then 100%. if the child is the type that wants like a little bit more, so then you can also you can make so choices you, together. Exactly. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. There's no such thing. There shouldn't be a thing as not having your child's input. If it's, I mean, I'm saying not on everything, but if it's their simcha, right. And then you bring that into the conversation. And like you said, maybe we're not able to finance what they want, but it's okay to understand what they want and mm-hmm. have that conversation. And why do you want that? Mm-hmm. And maybe they realize, oh, I only want it because Joey had it like um, that, but really, really you know, Wow. How amazing that even at such a young age, it can start thinking like that. Exactly. And what a gift really to give our children to be able to tap into that, you know, wellspring of self-awareness. It really Mm -hmm. is just... I got my work cut out for me. Oh, well, yeah. We don't worry. You're not alone. <laughs> and you know what? Going back to that, like, it's okay for our kids also to see that we are working on our trust in God yes. continuously that, yeah. oh, like, like it, we're all a work in progress. And again, the op- I think that openness is such a big part of this. Openness with our husbands, openness with our children. It's such a big game changer when it comes to our finances. And it's funny because people always think like, oh, well, it's, teach me, teach me the how, teach me the money, teach me. How do you invest? How do you do that? I could teach you all that really. But like, mm-hmm. like it's all context and content, right? This cup that I'm holding, mm-hmm. this is the context. Put Whatever you're bit. believing. That. Oh, good actually, oh, I thought you were showing message. the quote. Think yeah, good yeah, yeah. and it will be good. Yes. Yeah. So whatever, this is a great context, actually. <laughs> Whatever you're believing <laughs> about money, about your worth, about the role of money in the world, about God Almighty, it's the context to everything that I'm going to teach you. So I could teach you the mechanics of budgeting, saving, investing. If the context is not proper, it's the mechanics are not going to work. Whatever I pour into this cup, the formula is not going to work. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Love this. This has been, this has been <laughs> absolutely fabulous. Yeah. Oh, you guys God. are great. This is so, so much. Fun. <laughs> All I'm thinking is I have to let's make sure my husband listens to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, we can listen together when you go on your money date. Oh yeah. There you go. Great idea. Money that's, a gr- that's a great, go on a walk together and listen <laughs> yeah, to the episode. To and then you ask them quite, so what do you, what do you think? Uh (laughs) get to know each other by the way it built it's a tremendous miss not having these money dates and these conversations it's missed potential of connection with your spouse it's getting to know your spouse on a whole new level Mm -hmm. the the transformations that happen in a marriage when we embark in this process are unbelievable because it's just a layer of knowledge that we don't have we we, we've been limiting ourselves we don't want to go there and when we do the level of empathy that is built towards each other and understanding of each other is unbelievable. And that's real connection. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah, we have so enjoyed this DMC (laughs) with you. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I am sure that all our listeners and watchers are just going to be like, Eating this up. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there's more on so there's more of it on Jewish Money Matters podcast and everywhere That's else. That's right. And you can find all of Yael's contact info, websites, podcasts, everything in our show notes. Check it out. And thanks, thanks again. Thank you guys for the job you're doing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Now it's time for this episode's takeaway. Money can be a stressful topic. Understatement, right? What part of Yael's advice about money resonated the most with you and will be the most helpful in relieving some of the stress associated with finances? Now it's time for today's five questions. Answering our questions is Eve Levy, who's the co-director of the L'Chaim Center for Inspire Living in Deerfield, Illinois, as well as a Momentum trip leader. If you could be any month in the Jewish year, which month would you be and why? Oh, I love Kislev. I love Kislev. It's my birth month. It is my namesake, Yehudit, which is really interesting. My parents didn't even realize that they gave me that name, that, that name connected to the holiday that I was born on. So I feel very connected to that holiday, to that month, to the energy and to the light that it brings in. What's your favorite mitzvah and why? Favorite mitzvah. Okay. Only one. Um, I think I'd like to say candle lighting just because I get to, to do that on a, on a weekly basis. And it's almost like a spiritual reboot. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes it's the, the week is so intense that I just, Oh, 
it's so, it's so precious to come to that moment and just let everything go, turn everything off and just be present. So I would say candle lighting. What do you do to recharge? Recharge. So I'm very, very, very into my Zumba class. It's actually called Frumba, Frumba Chicago. It has revived me. It's, it's such a recharge. In fact, I come in there carrying the, the weight of the world sometimes on my shoulder. And when I leave an hour later, I am like free as a bird. It is the most amazing thing to be with from ladies dancing, enjoying, having so much fun. Time passes like in a second, feels like a second. That's a good workout. <laughs> what do you love about yourself? I love myself and I, I hope everyone does love themselves, but I, what I, what I truly love, and I think it's kind of like a gift that you could put me in a room with, with anybody and I will find something to connect with and I'll find something special about that person. I, I kind of go around this world looking for people's light. It's one of my hobbies. It's literally like it's I, I challenge myself even with difficult people to somehow find what makes them so special. And I have never failed at finding some precious light and something that I could learn from. So I kind of go around collecting people's, I don't know, the beauty of people and learning from it. So I think that's a gift. I love that about me. It's fun. <laughs> what do you think the firm world needs more of? Well, could I flip that question around? I think the from world needs less fear and more love, more, more love, unconditional love for each other, for our own children, for Hashem's children. I think when we're in a place of fear, which I feel so often, it's, it's like we react out of fear. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to connect. It's hard to bring people in. And right now we need a lot of connection. So I would say we have to push away the fear and the fear is real. And we need to just embrace people, open our arms and, and, you know, lead with love. Okay. Now the end has come to another deep and meaningful, we hope, episode (laughs) of Deep Meaningful Conversations. So sad. Mm, But have no fear. We'll be back in two weeks. In the meantime, you can check out our Facebook and Instagram pages for extra content about our episodes. And here's your reminder to subscribe to our podcast as well as rate and review it if you would be so kind. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And don't forget to download the Meaningful Minute app where you can also find us and additional content. Yeah, it's great. Um, We, of course, can't say goodbye without thanking Meaningful Minute for helping to bring deep, meaningful conversations to you, both in video and audio format, which we're so grateful for. And you guys are the best. Thank you. See you next episode.